All right. So thank you everybody for joining us this evening. Um, we will be talking about Audubon's Climate Watch program and everything that entails um, a bird and climate change community science collaboration. Now the Climate Watch program runs, um, occurs over two times a year. Um, our winter survey takes place from January 15th to February 15th. And our spring survey takes place from May 15th to June 15th. Sorry, my computer's kind of freezing. Um, and now it, all it asks is that you are able to um, survey at least a half a day during these two periods of time. Now, in October 2019, Audubon released a comprehensive report on how 604 North American bird species would fare under climate change. The report, Survival by Degrees, 389 species on the brink, um, allowed us a glimpse at what could be if we do not take action now to stabilize climate change. And so in order to understand how birds may respond to climate change, Audubon scientists modeled the ranges of 604 species by leaking, linking bird occurrence data with environmental information to estimate the current range of the species. They then projected this onto different climate change scenarios to see how the species range may change as climate changes across North America. Now I will say there are a few examples from the East Coast. Um, I pulled some of these slides from National Audubon's um, presentations just because it's laid out so well and it describes it perfectly and makes it just very simple for you guys to understand. And so here we have a wood thrush as an example. We can see how the species range is anticipated to change at a 1.5 degrees Celsius scenario. Now at this scenario, the wood thrush is considered a low vulnerability to climate change. Uh, with little range loss, and most of its range is still suitable. Now we can also see all the way from red, oranges, yellows, greens, to blues, going from range loss to range gain. Um, we can also see the second projection if there was a three degrees Celsius increase. Um, and at this point, the wood thrush would be considered a high vulnerability to climate change with much of its range considered no longer suitable. Um, and Audubon scientists looked at all 604 species in this way to understand which species were vulnerable to climate change based on the range loss and range gain. And so after assessing each of the 604 species vulnerability to climate change, more than half, 64% of the birds in North America, came up as being vulnerable to climate change. So um, this highlights that the future for birds is pretty dire in the fact when it comes to facing climate change. One of the key takeaways, however, is that reducing emissions makes a big difference if we can stabilize climate change to the, at least the 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, and at that point, 76% of these vulnerable species um, would have reduced vulnerability, less range loss, and only 38% are no longer vulnerable at all. So it's a pretty big difference. And now here, we are looking at the potential range change for the mountain bluebird in the summertime. Um, this species has up to 53% range loss and only 9% range gain. We can see the range loss, all the red here in the western portion of the U.S. and a little bit of tiny range gain in the upper northern part of British Columbia as well as parts of Alaska, which is very minimal compared to the range loss. 
Um, now that is a lot of change. One of the bigger questions is, is will the birds follow all these changes on the landscape, as well as will they be able to adapt to this changing climate? How will they do with all these changes? Um, and all, will they also move to the more suitable ranges? It's all part of the bigger question that we're trying to answer with this project. Um, and also how closely will the future ranges match the National Audubon's predictions, such as this map that we are looking at right here. And given these future, these are future projections, it is imperative to understand how closely birds track the anticipated changes. So to understand how well birds will follow these changes, we really need monitoring at a large spatial scale. And that is why this climate watch survey is taking across the entire North America, or the United States at least. Um, we need to track how these birds are responding in real time to both validate the National Audubon models and to also improve their models and predictions. Um, Audubon Strength has always been our network of people interested in the well-being of birds. Um, Audubon volunteers have always been on the forefront of informing science in bird conservation, since the very, even since the very first Christmas bird count that was over a hundred years ago. Now, in response to the Survival by Degrees report, thousands of people came forward and asked how they could help make the world a better place for birds and what they can do to help monitor just anything that they could do to help. And that is how this Climate Watch program was created, was mainly because of that Survival by Degrees report. Now, the Climate Watch survey aims to document species responses to climate change by having volunteers in the field look for birds where the Audubon's climate models project they should or shouldn't be in the 2020s. Now, a participant is somebody who goes out and conducts the climate watch surveys, aka you guys. Um, the, they need to be able to conduct point counts for at least one day during the count period identify the target species, or at least learn how to, um, as well as communicate with the chapter coordinator, myself or Amy, as well as the National Climate Watch team. They have a great team there that is able to reach out to. Um, and so this is a very brief overview, um, or a high level overview, as the five steps that we will go over. Um, the first step being choosing a target species. Um, now these, or Climate Watch focuses on the few target species that have good models, meaning that they predict the current range of the species well, and they have strong predictions for change into the future. Many of these species are considered climate vulnerable, um, across these species, we have a wide geographic cover coverage across the country. And the species that are present in the summer and or winter, so that we can also look at the broader changes in both seasons due to climate change. The target species are also easy to identify and charismatic, making them an ideal species that people would like to go survey and they can also learn quickly from them. So the first step is to pick out the target species. Now in Montana, we will be focusing on the nuthatches, the white-breasted, red-breasted, and the pygmy nuthatches. Now here for an example is a comparison of whether or not if you wanted to survey for the white-breasted, or in this case, the Eastern bluebird, um, which we of course don't have in Montana. Um, but this just goes to show that if you were to compare both of them, which one do you choose? Um, we can see for in this example that both species would be good species to survey 
However, the white-breasted nuthatch has more change anticipated for this particular location. Um, uh, the variety of colored squares that are representing the gain and loss versus the eastern bluebird who has mostly gray and you know some are slightly worsening. Um, so in this case we would want to survey the white-breasted nuthatch for this particular location. Um, not to say that even if you do choose a square that is gray, um, that is still a good square to survey because I'm sure they are still there. Um, and it's also good for National Audubon to know that these birds are present here. And so step two would be to select the squares to survey. Now, when it comes to Montana, not all the squares will be accessible, especially during the winter time. So please do take into consideration when you are choosing your squares. Will they be accessible and will they be safe for you to get in and out of there? Um, also take into consideration coming back to these same squares year after year for consistent data. Now, once you have selected your square and you want to survey, the next step is to select the 12 points within that square um, at which where you will conduct your surveys. Now, each of these surveys locations should be within your selected square, uh, situated within the best habitat you are able to identify for the target species. <clears throat> and they have to be at least 200 meters away from each of the other survey points. Um, and number one is make sure that you are choosing survey locations that is appropriate habitat for target species. Now you can select your points using your personal knowledge, landscape, in-person scouting, reports, using eBird, um, satellite maps, as well as many other tools. Um, if you wish to survey more than one target species, you may do so. Um, if the target species have the same habitat, you can survey for more than one species in one square and at the same point or same 12 points. Um, let's see. However, if they do have different habitat preferences, for example, bluebirds versus nuthatches, at that point, separate the survey points and they should be planned for each species. Now, in terms of survey locations, whether you need them to be clumped or spread out, um, it doesn't really matter. Uh, choose your points based on the best habitat for the nut hatches and what is possible for you to complete in one day. Uh, there are various methods you can do to ensure your points are at least 200 meters apart. Um, we have this Esri buffer tool, which I will actually go over um, once I'm done sharing this presentation. We'll jump on this planner that you can see in this image here. I'll be able to go into detail and walk you guys through that. And um, if you guys wanna be able to plan out your points ahead of time, or I know some of you guys are returning from last year, if you already know your points, um, that's awesome. And actually this uh, Climate Watch Planner actually has some of your points on there from last survey. So very exciting that they got the data up so quickly. Um, now, different ways you can measure to make sure that you are 200 meters apart is this Esri buffer tool, which will be on the Climate Watch Planner I'll go over. You can either, in the field, you can do pacing, or if you're driving, you can use your odometer. Or if you have a GPS, or you can use your phone. Now, step four would be to conduct your surveys. At each of your 12 points, uh, you'll be conducting a five minute stationary point count. When conducting your surveys, we ask you to record all of the birds you detect within 100 meters of that survey point. Um, and that is to prevent double counting any areas. 
Now, if you're only able to identify just the target species, that is okay. Um, please also record the presence of any nest boxes or feeders at your point, as well as your chosen target species. Um, be sure to keep separate checklists for each individual point. All surveys within the square should be conducted on the same day, uh, preferably before noon, although afternoon is also an option if you need more time or the weather is just not working out for you. Um, surveys can be conducted with one to three participants. Um, this being a COVID year, we strongly encourage that you either do it individually or if you do have a friend join along with you make sure they're within your close social pod or immediate family as well as uh, masking and maintaining that six feet of social distancing now on average these surveys tend to take anywhere from two to six hours so come prepared dress warm um, bring snacks bring water um, also take into consideration that the survey once again takes place January 15th through February 15th. Very cold weather, very cold time of the year. Um, and so be sure if you have a cell phone or any kind of electronic device that that is well charged. So you don't want your battery to die because of the cold weather. Now the fifth step is to um, enter your, or entering your data while you're in the field. Now there are three options. You can use the eBird app, the Audubon app, or you can use a paper form. And I'll go into detail on all of them. Now let's see here. For the eBird app, you can either use the mobile app or you can use the online source. Now in this case, I can imagine some of you will be using the eBird app. So it is also very helpful for you to name your checklists in a way that will make it easy for you to find later for your data submission, as well as for future Climate Watch surveys. So we can see an example here, um, you, and you don't have to do it exactly like this. It's just a very laid out, well laid out example for you guys. Um, we can see the square number, the survey number out of 12, um, the target species, as well as the latitude and longitude, and then a little indicator of where you are at, 300 feet from a water fountain. And next, you will be sure to record all of the species that you observe. And then provide information before you submit your survey. In the comments section, provide that the chosen target species, and if there's any nest boxes, feeders are present, um, indicate you are submitting a checklist of all the birds you are able to identify. That is, um, that is, was the stationary count for five minutes. And also be sure to record how many observers were with you. All right, I guess I forgot to click a few things. Um, but yes, here's a good example. We can see the number of observers, the duration, five minutes, the protocol, stationary, um, and how many birds were reported. And then you can email the checklist. And I'll go over the submitting the second portion in just a minute. Now the second option is the Audubon Bird Guide app. Um, this Climate Watch submission form in the Audubon app is only available during the count period. So as of right now, you are not able to see this um, if you were to download the Audubon app. Um, please note that it does have all the information laid out for you here. You just kind of go through, enter it one by one for each point. And now if you're a little more old school and only want to do paper form, that is totally okay. Um, if that's how you prefer to 
collect your data in the field. Now, when it comes to formatting and sending in the data, um, eBird has a second step process. So you're in the field, you collect all your data, you have all your checklists. Once you get home, you then go on to your online on the computer and use the desktop version. Um, and don't go through your mobile device through this. Um, the mobile feature from your checklist does not have this unique eBird submission ID that uh, National Audubon needs to match the data in the database. So make sure that you don't um, immediately send off your eBird data to them. Wait to go home and do this. So how it works is you will go on to your My eBird. You will then click on my manage my checklists and then you will go to let's see here you will click the edit or view option and from there you can get the url number and that url you put into an email and you do this for all of the 12 checklists that you have and you will submit that information to climatewatch at audubon.org which will be at the very end of this powerpoint and there's also a second option or sorry i kind of did this backwards um, in their case option number one there is an online data data submission that you can use and you can just put in the where the checklist number one is you can just put your url right into there and then the option number two is submitting it through an email now if you were to use the audubon app once you enter in all your data audubon automatically has all the information and you have no further work to do um, so this one is probably the most simple, although it doesn't, I know you guys like to keep track of all your lists and whatnot, so either one is also a good option. Now if you do go the paper form route, they do ask um, that you uh, download the Climate Watch Data Collection Template Excel bread Spreadsheet. Um, and enter your data under each of the relevant spreadsheet columns. Um, and then you send this form into the climate watch at audubon.org. And this is actually available um, on the montanabirdsurveys.com, all these links and everything. And so this is the second option. You can also just scan in your paper form and send it over to Audubon. Um, this option they don't prefer as much just because they get thousands of checklists each survey period. So filling out that Excel sheet will be very simple for them and make it a little more streamlined for them. Now, some of the resources that we have and that you can go over to help um, you throughout your process if you want to read a little bit more into stuff. Um, there's of course the 2019 Survival by Degrees Climate Change Report that National Audubon put out. Um, it goes over the sh range shifts for over 300 species starting in 2020 and going through 2080. Um, it includes information on their ranges, are predicted to shrink, shift, or expand, and can show you the long-term trends that are predicted for our area or anywhere or any area throughout the United States. Um, there's also the Climate Watch website, the audubon.org slash climate watch. Um, this has pretty much all of the information as well. It's a great resource to share. Um, it's not necessary enough information that can, oh, sorry. Um, there's also this more in depth um, Climate Watch Survey Manual. This is, goes into a lot of detail 
um, if there are any like missing questions that you are unsure about. Um, very helpful information within there. And then myself, I'm also always available to uh, be at your contact if you have any questions. Um, there is also this survey report from winter 2017 period um, that you can also read about. Now, let's see here. At this point, I will go ahead and switch over to the planner tool to kind of walk you guys through that. We also have this resource available for you all, um, montanabirdsurveys.com slash climate change or climate watch, sorry. Um, and we kind of laid it out, everything you need. Here's all these resources that I just talked about, the climate watch manual, um, the eBird data submission. Uh, you can see what squares are available. Um, the, let's see here, the climate watch webinar, there's, you can watch this again. We will also be recording this, or we are recording this and I'll be posting this at a later date. We can also see the climate watch results from previous years. And then it also goes step by step through the surveys or how to do the survey once again. Now, one thing that gets very confusing, I even get a little confused about it, is this survey planner. And they also have a claim, a square as well. They combined them this year. Last year they were separate. Um, so right now we will focus on the survey planner. So what I first recommend, if you're doing this on your own at a later date, uh, you can go ahead, first zoom into Montana because it gets really hard to load if you are, um, I'll go ahead and zoom into Missoula. And let's see here. So we have all these different layer options. And I also like to do, just so we can see what's going on here. Um, so this, the main portion or reason for this survey planner is this um, tool that you can use to add survey points. So you can pre-plan where you want to conduct your 12 survey counts. And so how this works is, let's see here. I must have forgotten to plan survey sites. Be sure to click that. So yes, you go into this layer options list. You make sure that all four of these are clicked. And then you can go into this add survey points. You can actually see I tested it out earlier. Here's a little red survey point that I placed. Um, and what you do is you pretty much just click on nuthatch and then you can place it right there. Now here is where you can fill out the year, the season, notes, um, as well as the site ID. So you can fill out all of that information. You can press close, and then you can see there are your two predicted survey points. Um, and if you want to make sure that they are 200 meters apart, you can go to this number three right here, and you can press planned survey sites. You press this black, uh, draw shapes in to select features, this little tool. And you kind of just click and drag. And you can see this little buffer, it means it's 200 meters. So these are um, well more than 200 meters apart. And that's just a little safety precaution, make sure that you are 200 meters apart um, to avoid double counting. And to get out of this buffer tool, you kind of just press this little warning button um, and once you actually have all your 12 points laid out, you can even print 
this map out. Um, I'll take a second to load. There are a few different options that we can see right here. I'll just go with the one that it came up with. Um, PDF is always good or the JPEG, whichever works best for you. In this case, I'll do PDF and then we can press print. Um, and, I'll, and I'm doing this, I'm not actually gonna print it right now, but I just wanna give you guys a good idea of what it looks like. So you kind of got to mess around with it. It's not the best tool out there. Um, so you may have to do a couple of these if you want to be able to get your 12 points. Um, but let's see here. So that is the survey planner tool. And then we go into claim a climate watch square. Now this, once it loads, uh, once again, zoom into Montana so that everything just loads a lot easier once you're a little bit more zoomed in. And so if we go to this layers list and then we click on any of the species of nuthatches, we can see what squares are actually already taken. Uh, blue is for winter, red is for summer, orange is for both. Um, and so I know these squares are pretty massive. They cover, there's two squares that cover the entire town of Missoula, which is pretty big. Um, and once again, you don't have to have your 12 counts spread throughout the entire square. You can have them clumped in one area just as long as it's the most suitable habitat for nut hatches. And let's see, one thing that I did forget to go over is how we were looking at the squares and we can see all the different colors. So how we do that is we go back into the survey planner and this climate watch suitability by species. We click this little down arrow and then once again, click on any of the nut hatches. And here is where we can see the squares change colors. Um, and once again, we can click the down arrow again and again. And we can see that um, all the way from improving to worsening all the areas for this particular pygmy, pygmy nut hatch. <coughs> Excuse me. And so this will help you decide on where may be an ideal square to survey. Um, the ones that are predicted to have more change, whether it be improving or worsening, um, is more ideal, but we also have to take into consideration where of doing the survey in Montana during the winter time and not everything is always accessible during the winter time. So even if you do choose one that is readily accessible and it is a gray square, totally okay. Um, safety is first. We don't want you guys to be put in a situation where um, you can't get in or out of. But, Let's see here. I'll go, that's pretty much everything that I had to cover and all the steps and process for the Climate Watch survey. Um, are there any questions or anything that you guys would like me to go back over? Um, I'd be happy to do so. I have a question, just a clarification. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like last year we, if we di did it in eBird or whatever, we were only supposed to record the target species. And now this year we do all species? Correct, yes. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. um, I will say on the Audubon app, if you guys choose to use that, the you can't record all of the species. The only option is to record the target species. Um, so that is kind of a downfall on using the Audubon app. 
Um, and Carmen, this is Amy real quick. I just, for some reason, I actually can't see a chat, which is, I've yeah. not seen happen yet on Zoom. Wow, but I, along weird. those same lines, um, wanted to just double check because the way that they have it, it's totally okay if you're only comfortable identifying the handful of target species as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yeah, I, I could basically what Christy said, yeah. I couldn't find a chat box either. I was looking. So you're not the only one, Amy. Uh, it's only the first time I've seen this, so we keep learning these things. Uh, yeah, I don't see it on my end either, which is very weird. This is my first time as well with, with that happening. Sorry, guys. Um, are there any further questions or anything else you guys would like me to go over? Hey, Carmen, this is Rebecca Barkley. Um, I've got a question about the mapping. Do we need to plot our survey points out on that map or will, will it populate based on our submissions? Yeah, so the, you do not have to do that. That is an optional um, source that you can use or not to use. Um, you can, when you go into the field, you can just make your survey points as you make them. Um, that is optional. Yeah, thank you. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. And this is Barb. Um, another question along those same lines is if we do plan points in that planner, does it show the coordinates? I didn't see them on your example so that we can put those coordinates into a GPS unit. Yeah, I did not see that either. Um, that is kind of a downfall on the on this survey planner that they have. Um, but it may, let me see. But if you, say for example, if you um, make your 12 points on the survey planner, uh, you click on that red square that popped up, it actually gives you the coordinates. So maybe once you um, print it out, and have a physical copy, you can always write in the coordinates right next to it. That's always an option. But yeah, it didn't, the coordinates do not automatically populate with that map option. You'd have to put them in there yourself. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any further questions? Um, well, I guess I will say that, let's see here, I believe all of you guys have my email. So if you guys are interested um, in conducting or doing the same survey squares that you did last year, or if you want new ones, go ahead and email me um, and I can get you squared away with those squares. Ha ha ha. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think I have squared one. Away. Uh -huh. <laughs> I have one more quick question, but mm -hmm. I think last year it took us, it might have taken us the full six hours to get, get it done. But of course, we were stumbling around, walking around logs, trying to make sure we were far enough apart from the, la from the other points. And so I think it, because we were laying out the points, it probably took longer. Mm -hmm. and, and we're off trail most of the time, but I'm assuming you still, no matter how long it takes, you want us to get it done in one day. Is that correct? Yes. Um, okay. Yeah, they do prefer one day. Um, even if it does go into the afternoon or into the later afternoon, that's totally okay. Um, yeah, doing your first square is usually going to take on the longer end. If you have multiple squares, I'm sure you'll get the hang of it as you go on. Um, but I have heard as the same issue as you, Christy, that it does take quite a bit of time, especially when it's your, you know, the first square of the season. And I think in our case too, we don't have, you know, there's some that are long trails, but a lot of the points were just off the trail, stumbling through the cottonwood bottom, and it's harder to navigate in there. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a quick question, Carmen. Um, yes. Just to clarify for 
the program, they prefer that you would do one survey per square during the time period and then do more squares rather than do the same square multiple times since there is sort of a time period to survey? Yeah, so if you want to, let me break down that question because you can survey the square um, or the same square more than once or with different bird species. So say for instance, if you were surveying for mountain bluebirds, you could survey that same square that you did for the pygmy nut hatches. The only thing is that they would have to be separate points and separate days. Um, and then, let's see, I'm sorry, Amy, what was the second half of your question? That the way the survey is set up, it seems like the preference is for us to be able to get more squares surveyed versus having a square surveyed more than once. Right, yes. Okay. You were right on that, sorry. I went the long way around that answer. No, that's helpful. Yep, because there's a nice long, good chunk of time to be able to get into one square, which is good. Mm -hmm. All right. Any last questions? Well, if you guys so do... If a, oh, go ahead. Oh, oh, this is Barb again. So if you have, say, so I'm doing white-breasted and red-breasted nut hatches in some squares, mm -hmm. and where, and red-breasted nut hatches seem to be a lot more variable or general in their habitat than white-breasted, and so, if I'm selecting points based on habitat for that's best for white breasted, but it's also suitable for red breasted, do and I want to use the same points for both, mm -hmm. does each species need to be still surveyed on a different day, or can one survey day account for be done for both species? Right. Um, so good question. I must have kind of confused. There's a lot of intertwining parts when it comes to this answer or question that you just had. Um, if they have the same habitat, such as the white-breasted and uh, red-breasted, if they have the same habitat, then you are more than welcome to have them in the same survey. You do not have to separate them and do two surveys. You can have them at the same point for each of your 12 points. But if you were to be surveying for the mountain bluebird versus the white-breasted, they, then they would have to be separated if because they are a little bit different in habitats. Got it. Yep, that makes sense. Yep. Yeah, thank you for that question. And there's a lot of intertwining parts with this survey. Um, any further questions? One last time. Can I follow up on that last question? Mm -hmm. um, so let's say you're at a, at a point, a survey point, and your target is white-breasted nuthatch. If you see a couple red-breasted nuthatch, are you supposed to submit both sightings? Yes, you can do that, yes. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our survey area had all three species of nuthatches. And we last year, we just did all three of them at the same time. Awesome. That's a perfect scenario right there. Will this video be available somewhere? Yes, I will make this. We will be putting this on our YouTube, and I can uh, send out an email to you guys once it is available. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Um, well, yeah, I guess that wraps up everything. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. Um, I hope this is all very informative for you guys. If there are any further questions, please reach out to me. Uh, my email is carmen at mtaudubon.org. I'm here to help you guys. But 
with all that said, have a great evening, everybody. You too. Thanks. Thank you, you Carmen. Too. Thanks. Thank You're you. Welcome. Bye, guys. Yep. Bye. 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 Thank Thanks. You.